Hello, everyone. I'm so honored to be speaking to you at the 2022 Global Learning Conference. As an occupational therapist, my job is to empower people to do the things they want and need to do. And one of my favorite things to work on is vocational or job success. I'll be sharing some tips, resources, and strategies on that subject today. So first, a little bit about me. My name is Emily Block, and I'm a telehealth occupational therapist in California. I have EDS myself. Here you see me pictured with a fellow zebra at the San Diego Zoo. I also work with many clients with chronic illness and connective tissue disease. I have no relevant disclosures, so let's get started. My goal for today is to give you some tools that you can use to forge your own vocational path. I'll go over some of the basics, some rights and responsibilities in the workplace, workplace accommodations, and finish up with some tips for success and resources. So first of all, how does EDS and HSD impact work? Well, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it even has positive effects. I've certainly seen that in the work I do. But for many of us, EDS and HSD will create at least some challenges in the workplace. Looking at the slide, I'm sure you're familiar with many of the things listed here at the bottom. Not only are there symptoms that may be disabling, but we often have fluctuations in those symptoms, which makes consistent work difficult. We face injuries, long recovery from surgeries, challenging environments, and stigma. If you feel that EDS impacts your work or education, you aren't alone. 82% of people with hypermobile EDS in a 2013 self-report study felt the same. In that same study, 55% of respondents were employed. Considering what we saw on the last slide, I find that number encouraging, but I think we can get that number even higher. Before we get to some of the ways we can do this, I wanna be very clear that your value isn't measured by whether or how much you work or the type of work you do. There are so many ways to contribute to your wellness, your family, your friends, and your community, and all are valid. Okay, let's look at some rights and responsibilities of the disabled worker. There's protections built in to many different levels of the government, starting at the federal or national government, and then all the way to individual arrangements you might have with your coworkers or your boss. Today, we'll focus on the federal government aspect, but I encourage you to look into all these different levels. So 1990 was a good year. The Berlin Wall was coming down, Home Alone was in theaters, my little brother was born, and the US finally signed into law the protection of people with disabilities in the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as the ADA. The ADA prevents discrimination on the basis of disability in many important areas of life. Today, we'll just be focusing on the employment aspect. The ADA ensures, among many other things, that you can't be asked questions about your disability in job interviews or before the job offer is extended. Employers must provide reasonable accommodations upon request, although there are some exceptions to that that we'll go over in a minute. Also, new construction needs to meet accessibility standards. So the ADA protects all aspects of employment from the interview and application process to job training and career advancement, and even things like company barbecues and picnics. And this is all great, right? There's a law protecting me. People with disabilities now have full protections and equal opportunities in the workplace, and everything is wonderful. In theory, yes, but there is some fine print. So workers must be able to do essential job functions with accommodations. So tragically, no matter how much I want to, I will never be a professional soccer player. There are just not enough accommodations in existence to make that happen, but that's okay. There's lots of other things I can do. Workers must also ask for reasonable accommodations. And if that sounds vague, um, that's because it is vague. There's some precedent and some agreement on what is reasonable and what isn't, but it's really decided on an individual basis with your employer, or if there's a disagreement, it's settled in the courts. Um, accommodations also cannot cause undue hardship to the employer. That's kind of another vague 
uh, concept that is ultimately decided in the courts. The ADA does not apply to any businesses with less than 15 employees, although check, uh, check your state and local um, regulations because that number could be actually much lower. And if an employer does violate the ADA and is covered by the ADA, the employee first has to file with the Equal Opportunity um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC. The EEOC will review the claim and decide if a lawsuit can move forward. And if a lawsuit can move forward, unfortunately, they tend to be pretty lengthy and expensive processes. There are some resources to help with this, though, like pro bono lawyers and the ACLU. So while the ADA is great on paper, and it really is a huge step forward, it doesn't fully protect disabled workers in practice, at least not without a huge burden being placed on people with disabilities. With that in mind, disclosing your disabilities or health conditions to your employer requires some careful uh, consideration and strategy. On one hand, studies show that disclosing can improve job performance, quality of life, and career longevity, among other things. Accommodations can be important for workplace safety too. And if you have a visible disability or a noticeable communication difference, it may make sense to open a dialogue about your condition sooner rather than later so that you get to control the narrative. There's also this quote by Karen Duffy that I love. Concealing an illness is like keeping a beach ball underwater. Isn't that a great visual? And it's so true, it's a great metaphor. So you should also consider the personal impact of the effort it takes to mask your disability or health condition at work. On the other hand, there's still stigma associated with disabilities, and you may find that you face this in the workplace after a disclosure. This can create situations of job insecurity, barriers to career advancement and fair pay, and difficult social working conditions. And although all these things are terrible and have no place in the workplace, not every company is covered by the ADA, as I mentioned before, and even for companies that are, it can be a challenging process to hold them accountable. So before you disclose, think about these things, make your own pro and con list, and think about the company's structure and culture of where you work or hope to work. If you do decide to disclose, the timing is also something to be strategic about. A 2022 study found that disclosure of disability led to worse ratings of employability among people who were surveyed. So if possible, it might be a good idea to delay your request for accommodations until after the job offer is extended. In addition to the ADA, there are many other federal protections that might apply to you or other workers with disabilities. Some of them are listed here for you to refer back to. Okay. So you've decided you're ready to ask your employer for accommodations. What do you ask for? That's a lot of responsibility placed on you and it can be a daunting question. Here are some, but certainly not all accommodations that are generally considered reasonable and may be helpful for the EDS and HSD worker. There's adapted workstations, which can include things like a standing desk or ergonomic seating, lifting assistance, which can come from coworkers or assistive technology. And luckily right now, work from home is very in thanks to COVID. There's also reduced hours and frequent breaks. A scent-free env environment may be considered reasonable if you have asthma, allergies, like from mast cell activation disorder or sensory sensitivities. Alternative hours may be a good idea if you have a certain time of day that you work best at that isn't during normal work hours. Assistive technology is a whole talk itself, so I definitely recommend looking into that or working with an occupational therapist for ideas. It's important that your work environment is access accessible so that you can safely get in, out, and around your workplace. Then there's also temperature control, which might be an option. Here we see a workstation adapted to physical needs in the upper right corner and one adapted for sensory needs in the lower right corner. We see the use of assistive technology, service dogs, accessible parking, and medical devices. In most cases, you have a right to these things if there is a need. 
So I was a little doom and gloom earlier about accommodations and disclosure. So let's look at some promising facts. Large businesses are often better at accommodating disabilities than small businesses. And in my experience, they're not just better, they are much, much better. So I really encourage you to look for bigger businesses in your industry or that are close to you. If you're a current valued employee, the Job Accommodation Network found employers to be more likely to be proactive about researching accommodations for you. And accommodations are often very cheap. In fact, 56% of accommodations cost absolutely nothing. That's a pretty surprising statistic for a lot of people. And for the ones that do cost money, the median one-time cost of accommodations is only $500. That's a deal when you consider that studies show that both employees and employers benefit from job accommodations. There are many places you can turn to for support when navigating job accommodations. I want to highlight one in particular, the Job Accommodation Network, or JAN. JAN has an amazing website which lists reasonable accommodations by condition or disability. They're a fantastic resource, and I recommend them to every single one of my clients who are either working or are interested in starting work. So now we're moving on to talk about some tips and tricks. When I work with clients on vocational success, this is the general process that we go through. When you're looking to start or continue working, there are some important questions you should ask yourself first. You want to do this for the right reasons, and you want to put yourself in situations where you can be successful. Ideally, work should contribute to your overall wellness. You might want to ask yourself, why do you want or need to work? Where, what do you enjoy? What are your passions? What skills do you have? And what things do you maybe need to work on? What accommodations might you need? And what are your career goals? Speaking of goals, <laughs> to help you get from where you are to where you want to be, writing concrete goals can be really helpful. The goal should tell you what you need to do in what time frame, and several short-term goals can help support your bigger long-term goals. Let's take a look at this example. So here we see someone who wants to work part-time as a front office medical administrative assistant. That's the what, and they wanna do this within one year. That's the timeline. And how can they do this? The short-term goals help answer that question. They plan to increase their sitting tolerance, conduct research, gain education, and learn how to be ergonomically supported in the workplace. When they break it down like this, the big goal seems much more manageable. You also don't have to jump right into working. I usually recommend people start with regular activity. So this is something that's scheduled, but has um, few hours and low responsibilities. Something like um, uh, an exercise class, if you're cleared for exercising or a community club. If that goes well, you can move on to things with more hours and more responsibility, such as volunteering, shadowing, or education. And from there, employment. If at any point along the way, you find that you just aren't up for it, that's totally okay. Rest, focus on your health and wellness, and you can always try again another time. Here are some general tips that I found support comfort and success when working. One of my favorites is using sensory strategies to help regulate your energy and mood. Now, this is a subject for a whole talk in itself. And in fact, I am giving a talk on sensory strategies to the junior zebras. It's also something that you can look up on your own or work with an occupational therapist on. In summary, there are some types of sensory input that increase energy and some types that are calming. You can use this knowledge to help your energy match your environmental and task demands. For example, I often reach an absolute brick wall of fatigue at about three o'clock every work day. This is why I keep a stash of extremely sour, like whole face puckering sour candies at my workstation. It really helps me wake up and plow ahead through the rest of the work day. You can also use energy conservation strategies like taking breaks, alternating difficult and easy work tasks, and pacing yourself. Pacing is also important in pain management, as is good body mechanics and things like ergonomic seating. 
work hard to empower yourself with knowledge about your condition and how to manage it. Understand what you can expect from your body and your mind and what you need from your environment. Be proactive and plan ahead. See challenges before they arise and address them before they become a problem. It's important to build a support network of family, friends, educators, and coworkers. It takes a village, not just to raise a child, but to support your goals and vocational development. And this is true for everyone, not just people with EDS or HSD. You can also find mentorship or inspiration from others who have succeeded in similar situations. Sometimes all, all we need to get started is just knowing that something is possible. And I know I'm going out of order here on the slide, but I wanted to draw particular attention to looking outside the nine to five office job. There are many opportunities out there and you may find that freelance work, work from home or entrepreneurship is a good fit for you. Personally, I found that starting my own business this year was a great fit for me. I make my own schedule based around doctor's appointments and rest breaks. I'm led by intrinsic motivation and my interest. And my boss, who is me, by the way, uh, is always willing to offer any accommodations I ask for with no fuss. And finally, always, always acknowledge your wins and your successes. So we don't have time to go over all of these, um, but please refer back to these slides for some important resources. Here's some sites to find gig, temporary, or permanent work. Some of these cater to people who need flexible hours or environments or workers with disabilities. These are also a great place to do career research. These are some general things that I recommend to my clients and use myself. And these are some excellent organizations and resources that I've worked, worked or volunteered with personally or referred clients to with great success. Many people with EDS and HSD can and do find success at work. I hope these things will help you on your vocational journey. Here are my sources I use for this talk and my image sources. And I just wanna thank you so much. It was a ple pleasure speaking to you today.